Okay, so sorry for those uh, technical difficulties. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with this uh, presentation. My name is Tony Ward. I'm with the University of Montana. And uh, I was uh, asked to talk about um, our experiences with residential wood combustion and how it impacts both uh, ambient air and indoor air. And then talk about some of the interventions that, uh, that we've used in, in uh, past studies throughout the past 10 or 15 years. So this is kind of an overview of, uh, of the talk. So I'll talk a little bit about the impact that wood smoke has on ambient air and then talk a little bit about uh, some source apportionment strategies that, that we've utilized in the past to figure out how much wood smoke is actually in the ambient air. And then uh, uh, cover I interventions focused on ambient wood smoke specifically. I'll talk about uh, wood stove changeouts and some of our experiences with, uh, with those, especially in Libby, Montana. And then uh, we'll switch gears and talk about how uh, residential wood combustion impacts indoor air quality and then finish off by talking about uh, interventions that that are geared towards reducing levels of wood smoke within our homes. So this is uh, this is kind of a, um, an evolution of this journey that I took to New Zealand just last month as part of the International Wood Smoke Research Network. and. This is uh, taken on one of the first days at uh, one of the at, uh, little conference that we had in Wellington. That's me with the gigantic yellow arrow pointed at the top of my forehead. So again, this is uh, my name is Tony Ward and I'm with the University of Montana. And as part of this group, we traveled all over New Zealand to Wellington, to Christchurch, to Queenstown, um, to, to Arrowtown and, and beyond. And just had a wonderful and amazing experience while down in, in New Zealand. And what I found out is that uh, New Zealand is a lot like um, Western Montana in regards to, to residential wood combustion and dependency on, on wood for, for home heating. This is uh, where I'm located in the United States, uh, far northwest corner of, of, uh, of, the, of the United States. So this is Missoula, Montana. And we are about, uh, I don't know, 150 miles from the Canadian border and uh, right on the edge of Idaho. Um, the, we have a fairly rural population in that we have a, approximately a, a million people in the whole state of Montana. So it's, it's not very crowded and uh, it's uh, um, very uh, mountainous where we live. This is the picture of the University of Montana where I work in, in Missoula, Montana. Uh, we have about 100,000 people in, in the city of Missoula with an, uh, about 13,000, 12,000 students here at the university. And today, ironically, is the, is the first day of classes. So as you can see, this is the University of Montana, very mountainous uh, and then valley locations, which, which really contribute to um, our air quality issues here in, uh, in our region, in the Northern Rockies of the United States. Um, so uh, because we have valley locations, uh, we also have temperature inversions that set up uh, throughout the winter months that can last anywhere from days to weeks on end. And during temperature inversions, it's typically very cold, very stagnant air, and then any emissions that go up into the air tend to, to build up and accumulate over significant periods of time. Another thing we have is lots of trees here in, in, uh, in the Northern Rockies and because it's cold and we have lots of trees, we have lots of wood burning. And not only is uh, residential wood combustion the, uh, the most common source of home heating in Western Montana, but it's also a very common source of home heating across the United States. In fact, there is, it's been estimated that there's about 11 million homes that report the use of home heating uh, of wood for either a primary, primary or secondary uh, heating source. And um, about 80%, uh, it's been estimated that 80% of the wood stoves that are out there in the United States are, are old and inefficient models. They're not the new low emission devices, uh, the EPA certified devices that, that uh, are, are commonly promoted today. So this is uh, some pictures of, of uh, Montana, but these are some pictures from New Zealand that uh, we took while we were down there on, on the wood stove tour. And uh, ironically, it looks very similar to, to what we have here in Western Montana. A lot of wood burning and uh, in addition to wood burning, lots of emissions from, from the stacks that go up into the air. 
So as far as wood smoke, just a little bit on, on why we study uh, wood smoke and kind of what it is. It, wood smoke is a very complex mixture of, of, uh, of you know, lots and lots of different uh, chemical compounds and, and uh, gas phase and particle phase. And, um, but the thing that we are primarily interested in or, or the pollutant that we're primarily interested in is particulate matter, specifically PM 2.5. And PM uh, stands for particulate matter, and 2.5 are the size of these particles. And to put it into perspective how small these particles are, if I were to take one of my hairs and chop it in half, uh, uh, it's about 70 microns or micrometers in diameter. And these 2.5 particles are um, about this size compared to the human hair, about 1 25th the size. And that has real implications when you start considering your body's natural defense mechanisms of, of protecting you from, from uh, particles that are in the air. We all have nose hairs and they do a good job of, of filtering out the larger particles, but these PM 2.5 particles are so small they can bypass our nose hairs and make it all the way down into our respiratory tract and cause adverse health effects. So this is what uh, an actual wood smoke particle would look like. This was collected several years ago on a filter and then we looked at it under a high powered microscope uh, we call it a, a, a scanning electron microscopy. Um, and just to give you an idea of the scale from here to here is about one micron in diameter. And when you scale in even further um, from here to here is about 300 nanometers. So just to give you a, an idea of what these, these wood smoke particles look like that are floating in the air. So because these particles are so small, you know, they, they, call it, they, they make it all the way down into our respiratory tract, deep in our lungs. And, and if you're exposed at high enough concentrations over long enough periods of time, uh, adverse health effects can occur. And there's been lots and lots of studies over the last 50 years that, that have shown I've shown the relationship between exposure to particulate matter and adverse health effects on human health. <coughs> a lot of these studies have been conducted in, in very, very urban areas and uh, because that's where the, the people are, you know, high concentrations of people, but also high concentrations of air pollution, including particulate matter. But the, the findings from a lot of these studies, you know, all point to the same things and that uh, Long-term exposure to PM 2.5 is, is associated with a variety of adverse health effects, including re reduced lung function, increased respiratory and cardiovascular hospital admissions, increased emergency department visits, and uh, increased mortality from lung cancer and heart disease. So basically, if you're exposed to high enough concentrations over long enough periods of time, you increase your risk of cardiovascular disease and, and respiratory issues uh, that can cause uh, morbidity issues and, and even death. So it's um, uh, uh, exposure to a particular matter is, is certainly not to be taken lightly. And because it causes adverse health effects, uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency has set health-based standards um, called National Ambient Air Quality Standards for, for PM 2.5. And we actually have two sets of standards. One is an annual standard of 12 micrograms per cubic meter. And the second one is a daily standard of 35 micrograms per cubic meter. Now, even in very uh, rural areas such as, as Western Montana, Northwest Montana, you know, where we just don't have a lot of people, we still have significant air quality issues, specifically particulate matter issues such as PM 2.5. But what we see is, uh, is very predictable trends of PM 2.5 annually. And this is a, a really good example of, of our trends throughout the year. And, and this is a little bit outdated, but it, it does a great job of showing the levels of PM 2.5 over periods of time. And this was actually one of the first PM 2.5 data sets from the state of Montana, collected in Libby um, way back in the winter of 01, 02. And what it shows, um, well, let me just explain that the, 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 the x-axis. So this is the date. The y-axis is the concentration of PM 2.5 in micrograms per cubic meter. And then these two lines, this is the annual standard of 12 micrograms per cubic meter. And then this is the daily standard of, 20, uh, of uh, 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So just to, to walk you through it, in the winter of 0102, it's very high concentrations when uh, PM 2.5 first was started uh, to being collected. And as it warms up, the, the concentrations drop. 
until the, the winter of 0203, where again, the concentrations kind of build up and they are uh, elevated for extended period of time. Then it starts getting warmer during the summer of 03 and they drop down, except for this event right there, that's where we had a, a, a forest fire, not very far from where these samples were being collected. Um, and then it rained and then it drops back down, but then it gets elevated again during the winter of 0304. So this is very predictable patterns of what we see annually of, of PM 2.5 concentrations and that there's very high levels of, of PM 2.5 during the winter months and pretty much low concentrations during the summer months, unless there's some type of forest fire event, which are becoming more and more common due to climate change. So we've done a lot of work with uh, our Montana Department of Environmental Quality and local health departments to figure out what are the sources of PM 2.5 during the winter months when they're we're so elevated. And the types of tools that we've used in, include uh, modeling techniques such as chemical mass balance and also looking at the chemistry of the particles, uh, looking at chemical markers of wood smoke, including levoglucosam, methoxyphenols, looking at the ratio of, uh, of potassium, and, uh, both element and, and ion, and also looking at levels of carbon-14 that are in the air. <coughs> so this is a map of Montana, uh, specifically western Montana. And ironically, this is uh, these are the mountainous regions here. And on this side of the state is very, very flat and uh, and windy a lot. So um, because there's not a lot of valleys, the, you know, the PM 2.5, if it is generated, it gets blown over uh, into Canada or somewhere else. But in this region of the, in the northern Rockies, very mountainous, a lot of valleys, um, very uh, significant temperature inversions that set up during the winter months, um, and then resulting in high levels of PM 2.5. So we've done studies in each one of these communities in western Montana, and then one recently in, in the Idaho Panhandle in a little community called Pinehurst. Um, and then we've also worked in Alaska, in Fairbanks, Alaska. Fairbanks actually has uh, the highest levels of PM 2.5 out of anywhere in the United States. So we've been working with uh, the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation um, for probably the last eight years to figure out what are the sources of PM 2.5 during the winter months at multiple locations throughout Fairbanks. So it all starts with, with monitoring. So setting up ambient monitoring sites and collecting um, ambient PM 2.5 on a variety of, of different types of filters. So these are uh, BGI PQ200. So uh, essentially they're sing, uh, single filter samplers. This is a speciation sampler um, called the SAS and it measures uh, or collects particles on, on nylon, Teflon and coarse filters. And then these are continuous monitors, the BAMs, and uh, and there's a, 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 a med station out here somewhere. Um, but these are the types of air samplers that we typically work with. And when we design these these programs, you know, we set them up so they can all collect samples over uh, the same periods of time. Typically, it's uh, you know midnight to midnight, 24-hour samples, cumulative samples, and then following the EPAs. Um, normal sampling schedule of every three days or every six days. So the filters that we collect include uh, the Teflon filters, nylon filters, and quartz filters, and, and di different filters. Um, they all collect the same particles, but we do, uh, typically do di different types of analyses to look at different types of analytes. So from the Teflon filter, where we do a gravimetric analysis to figure out how much weight is gained or a PM 2.5 is gained over a period of time. We do uh, an X-ray fluorescence analysis to, to get an idea of what elements are composing the particulate matter. From the nylon filter, we're looking at um, ions, cations, and, and anions. And then from the coarse filter, we're looking at organic carbon and the elemental carbon. And I'll come back to this filter in a, in a few minutes, this extra quartz filter. So, like I said, these are the, the types of analyses that are typically done on these three types of filters. Um, we take advantage of uh, the, the chemical speciation network that's set up across the United States and that there's uh, historically uh, been lots of speciation monitors or speciation monitoring sites across the United States. 
we've had either one or two that that have been in operation here in Montana for the last uh, ten years or so. So um, typically, we'll we'll take advantage of of the data uh, uh, that's typically generated. Um, so these samples are collected as part of the, the chemical speciation network, sent to Re Research Triangle Institute uh, for a bunch of analyses, and then we'll, we'll just get the data. Or other times we'll get one of these speciation monitors, um, collect the filters ourselves, and then send it off to one of our contractor laboratories that we work with um, for these same type of analyses. But again, from the Teflon filter, you get mass and elements. From the nylon filter, we get anions and cations, and that includes ammonium, potassium, sodium, nitrate sulfate by ion chromatography. And then from the quartz filter, it's elemental carbon and organic carbon. So the model that we typically use is the chemical mass balance model. And this is one that, uh, that EPA supports. It's on their, their um, website for download and along with lots of different manuals and, and uh, training modules. But uh, it's, it's been the, the source apportionment um, uh, mo modeling strategy or mo uh, model that we've used for, for 15 years now. And uh, so it works, seems to work pretty well, especially in conjunction with uh, looking at the other um, chemical markers, which I'll mention in just a second. Um, so it's a, a multiple linear regression model. Um, and the idea of the, using the chemical mass balance model is it, it identifies what the major sources of PM2.5 are and then how much so, uh, um, PM2.5 each source contributes to the overall measured PM2.5. So the, as far as the model inputs, you know, it takes information from the filters as far as, you know, the, the, um, the different types of analytes and the uncertainties. Um, and then it, we also put in information about potential sources of PM2.5 in, in the airshed. And those are called source profiles or, or uh, fingerprints. And the typical source profiles or fingerprints that we use um, for, for all of our uh, source apportionment studies include this list. Uh, street sand, road dust, secondary emissions, including sulfate, ammonium sulfate, ammonium, ammonium nitrate, um, several profiles for, for gas exhaust and diesel exhaust, tire and brake wear, wood combustion, um, and then, you know, we probably have 20 profiles that, that we use, uh, different types of residential profiles with different types of fuels, um, different combustion um, uh, stages, smoldering versus flaming, uh, fireplace emissions, slash burning, prescribed fire emissions, and then forest fire emissions. And that just gives us, uh, uh, it's kind of the same uh, anal uh, uh, analytes, but just different concentrations. But uh, we, we load them all up and, and it gives us a good way of getting a handle on, on the, uh, the wood combustion contribution. We also put in source profiles on meat cooking and then fuel oil combustion, residual oil combustion. So where we get these source profiles are from uh, the Speciate 4.0 database that the EPA maintains and also uh, Long time ago, in, in the 80s, we had uh, a group of of our, our local health department um, uh, personnel that, that collected some some uh, source profiles from from residential wood stoves here in town. So they basically stuck a probe up in a variety of different stacks around town, um, fireplaces, and and collected some really representative uh, wood smoke emission profiles. You know, under actual burn conditions, using fuel types that are very similar or that that are similar, um, that repli directly replicate what we use here in Western Montana and the Northern Rockies. So we typically get very good fits when we use those profiles that were developed in the 1980s. So out of all the, the, the CMB um, source apportionment studies that we've done throughout the years, this is typically what we get. It gives us a pie chart and it, again, it, it identifies what the sources of PM2.5 are in the, in the air sheds and then how much each source contributes to the overall PM 2.5. And every single source profile that we've done, we see that wood smoke, uh, emissions from residential wood combustion contributes anywhere from 50 to 80% of the PM 2.5, um, no matter uh, what location that we're looking in, um, uh, different sites, but always the same thing. Wood smoke is a major source of PM 2.5 during the winter months. The other types of sources that we typically see are diesel exhaust, 
a little bit from street sand, um, but more like uh, during late spring when the, the ice melts and we start to see uh, some, some thaw. A um, little bit from sulfate, and that, that's from uh, fuel oil burning and, and some diesel exhaust. Ammonium nitrate, which is a secondary indicator of cars and trucks and industry in an area. And then uh, some contributions from automobile exhaust. But by far, our largest contributor to, to wintertime PM2.5 in our outdoor air is residential wood smoke. And this has been confirmed through other types of models, such as uh, positive matrix factorization models, PMF, or um, what we commonly do is look at the chemistry of the particles and analyze our filters for levoglucosan and, and carbon-14 as, uh, as, as ways of double-checking our, our modeling results. So I mentioned this, uh, this filter here. So oftentimes when we're, we're carrying out these source apportionment programs, we collect an extra quartz filter. And what we'll do with that is oftentimes cut it in half and one half we'll send off to the University of Arizona to some of our collaborators and do a carbon-14 analysis. And the other half we'll analyze here at the University of Montana for chemical markers of wood smoke, such as levoglucosan and, and, uh, and other chemical markers. And these, these are just some of the chemical markers that we've used in the past. Levoglucosan is kind of the, the, the well-known marker for wood smoke. It's a formation product of uh, a pyrolysis of cellulose. Um, and, you know, when you measure P or when you find levoglucosan, it, it means that it comes from a wood burning source. So it doesn't come from diesel exhaust or from other sources. You know, if you find it, then it comes from wood smoke. We've also looked at other methoxyphenols um, and then other resin acids, but we've kind of narrowed the list to really focusing on. <clears throat> I'm focusing on levoglucosan now. <clears throat> so the, the, when we, we find or we measure levoglucosan in, in the filters, and typically it's in the nanograms per cubic meter range, you know, we, especially in wood-burning communities, we see very strong trends or correlations with ambient PM2.5 concentrations. And then we also are interested in looking at the ratios of levoglucosan to organic carbon and overall PM2.5. And, and then we can compare it to other wood burning communities just to see, you know, what, the, what those ratios are. And it gives us an indication of how much wood burning is taking place. And um, for reference, and what the, some studies we did in Libby, you know, prior to the wood stove change out, levoglucosan was found to, uh, to be about 10% of the overall PM2.5. So that was a significant amount of uh, leaf glucosan in the air. And in Fairbanks, where, where we're working now, we see um, lower levels because there's other contributors to PM2.5, such as fuel oil burning for home heating, a little bit of coal combustion for home heating. Um, but we do see, still see it at, at high levels because there is quite a bit of wood burning in Fairbanks too. So carbon-14, what that is, it's a, it's a, a long-lived radioisotope of carbon. And when we, we do analyses for it and, and uh, on the PM2.5 particles, we're looking to see if it's present and if it is at, at what concentrations or, or what levels that is present. If it's present at, at atmospheric levels, then, uh, that, then that means that the PM2.5 derives from a recent plant, plant product. So it's basically a, an alive carbon is what we call it. Whereas if we don't see any carbon-14 in, in, uh, in the particulate matter, then it means it derives from uh, the, the particles derived from a petrochemical or fossil fuel source um, because of the fossil fuel has been in the ground for a long time. So it's, a, it's not a modern carbon source, whereas trees are a modern carbon source. So what we do is we, we measure carbon-14 and you know, we stick it in these fancy equations. And basically what it tells us is, is how much of uh, the, the PM2.5 in the ambient air comes from residential wood smoke or wood burning. And this is a technique that, that we've used in, in collaboration with our partners at uh, University of Arizona, particularly Todd Lang at the, at the uh, NSF Arizona AMS facility. Um, for the last 10 years or so. And for most studies, it, it tracks really well with, uh, with what we see, uh, uh, the wood smoke contribution identified by, by CMB. These are all communities in Montana, heavily wood burning, 
And as you can see, this is the, the percent of wood smoke identified by carbon, uh, by, uh, by chemical mass balance. This is the amount of wood smoke identified by carbon-14 analyses. And if we see pretty good trends um, for most of the, the air sheds until we got to Fairbanks, Alaska. And because they have a lot more coal burning that I mentioned and residential oil burning, you know, different types of sources, therefore different types of, uh, of chemistry and makeup of the particles in the air. And we saw that the, the carbon-14 didn't work as well in, in that more complex air shed than what we see here in western Montana. Um, it, for example, in one of the, the sites which is more urban in nature, less wood burning, uh, the CMB model kind of uh, identified, um, perhaps overreported the amount of wood burning, whereas carbon-14 had a, a lot, almost half as, as much uh, uh, wood smoke contribution identified. Whereas uh, in another site in, in Fairbanks where it was predominantly wood burning, we identified almost 80% of the PM2.5 came from wood smoke. Whereas the carbon-14 identified anywhere from 55 to, to 66 percent. Um, regardless, you know, these, uh, it's, it's oftentimes hard where they completely line up. But what they can do is, is using these, you know, different types of modeling techniques and, and, uh, and, and uh, chemical analysis techniques. Basically, what you're trying to do is uh, just find some agreement. Uh, regardless of how much the, the wood smoke is, uh, identified from the carbon-14, it still shows that, you know, most of the PM2.5 comes from a wood smoke source. And when you couple those findings with what you see from the CMB modeling and levoglucosan, it's kind of looking at all these different parts, but it's all kind of telling a piece of the a piece of the story. All saying that that residential wood combustion is, is a, a major source of PM2.5 in the airshed. And in fact, here in the Northern Rockies, it is the primary source of PM2.5 throughout the winter months. We also, and, and again, that's, you know, not only specific to the Northern Rockies, but also, um, you know, throughout Canada and Alaska and the, the East Coast, so anywhere there's trees, anywhere there's wood burning and it's cold, you know, there's going to be high concentrations of PM2.5 from, from residential wood combustion. And I'll also mention that, that we see high levels of, of wood smoke during our fall and spring when there's a lot of slash burning in our region. Um, and then, you know, people start to burn trees and or, or limbs and leaves in their yard in, in late fall. And uh, so we get a lot of wood smoke from that. And then during the summer, you know, we're starting to see more and more forest fires, as I mentioned, from, uh, from climate change. So wood smoke is kind of a year round thing around in, uh, here in Western Montana these days. So as far as interventions targeting ambient air, you know, we've identified that there is a lot of wood smoke in the air. So, so you know, one strategy that is typically used by, by the regulators here, including EPA, is to promote the wood stove change out as a way of reducing levels of ambient PM 2.5. And that's simply taking out an old polluting wood stove and, and, uh, and replacing it with a low emission uh, e uh, EPA certified stove. And there's been lots and lots of wood stove changeouts here in, in, uh, in the United States, but probably the most famous one and the most high-profile high one was, was the one that was conducted in Libby, Montana um, in the last decade. So when I first uh, started really getting into in the PM 2.5 studies, um, you know, early 2000s, this is... Uh, this was the map that was floating around. This was the first map of, of non-attainment areas of PM 2.5 uh, in the United States. And what non-attainment means is they uh, these communities or these counties don't meet the uh, the national ambient air quality standards for PM 2.5. Remember, I mentioned that the the annual standard and the daily standard. And back then, the in, in the early 2000s, the annual standard was 15 micrograms per cubic meter. The daily standard was 65 micrograms per cubic meter. And again, today it's 12 for the annual and then 35 for the daily. This is, uh, you know, I, I was approached by our Montana uh, Department of Environmental Quality with this map. And they said, have you seen this, uh, this map? And, you know, we want to know what's going on. And basically what it shows is that this little community way up here in northwest corner of Montana, they have uh, 
just as bad air quality, if not worse air quality, than the major metropolitan areas across the United States, including the, the LA Basin, so Southern California, the, the uh, um, Central Valley of California, high levels of air pollution. And even um, Libby, Montana specifically had, had higher concentrations out of a lot of these urban and industrial areas across the Midwest and then you know, in, in the Northeast United States. Ironically, this, uh, this little community up here, Libby, Montana, is, uh, looks like this. And there's only about uh, less than 3,000 people that live in this community. So Libby, Montana had as bad air quality as, as LA and New York City and, and even worse air quality than, than Houston, Texas, the, one of the largest industrial ports in the entire world, and Denver, Colorado, and Salt Lake City, Utah. So this, this little valley had some significant air quality issues, um, and it is a beautiful valley. So when we did our original source apportionment uh, study using chemical mass balance um, way back in the winter of 0304, this is what uh, kind of kicked off the, 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 the big wood stove study um, in, in that it showed that 82% of the particles in, in Libby during the winter of 0304 came from residential wood smoke and that we didn't see any other uh, significant contributions from other sources of PM2.5 bit from diesel, a bit from uh, automobiles, ammonium nitrate, sulfate. I think uh, just very, very little contributions to street SAM. But by far, it was a single source air shed, meaning that residential wood stoves were the predominant source of particulate matter in that air shed. So as a result, um, you know, it, it really became a, 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 almost a test case for, for looking at the impact of, of a community-wide wood stove change-out program. So uh, it was uh, several million dollars were raised and funded this this community wide wood stove change out program, and you know as as uh, as researchers it provided us with a great experiment uh, to look at a variety of things. This uh, this wood stove program I think it's important to note that there was actually two phases. They they, they switched out or changed out 1,200 old wood stoves between 05 and 08. Um, that there was two phases. The first phase really focused in on those those low income families, really uh, high emission wood stoves, really poor quality wood stoves, and basically the worst of the worst. Um, and then there was a, a phase two that that pretty much took care of the rest of the wood stoves in the community. But this phase one uh, part of the the wood stove change out really had the most impact, which I'll show in just a second. So as I mentioned, as researchers, uh, with the Libby wood stove change out being about three and a half hours away from us, it, it really provided a, a fantastic opportunity to look at, you know, the, the impact of the wood stove change out on, on a community, on individual homes, uh, looking at, um, you know, how if you lower levels of wood smoke, how does that improve respiratory health? Um, and then, you know, as an atmospheric chemist such as myself and an air pollution guy, I was really interested in, in looking at the chemistry of these particles and, and how they changed over time. So we looked at a whole bunch of different things and my partner on the project was Curtis Noonan, um, uh, who works here at the University of Montana as well. So again, it all started with monitoring. So um, really comprehensive ambient monitoring program, uh, lots of different types of, of uh, filters being collected. And uh, it, it was the, the BG, BGI PQ200, so the single filter samples, the speciation samplers, um, again, 24 hour samples, midnight to midnight. And we basically collected samples all winter long and what we define winter as November through February, the first of first part of November through the end of February, and uh, we collected samples for for many consecutive winter periods um, throughout the, the the before the wood stove change out, during the wood stove change out, and then after the wood stove change out. We also collected. Uh, um, particles on using a puff sampler, a polyurethane foam uh, sampler. And from that, we analyzed um, both the, the, uh, the filter and the puff cartridge for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, which are important because they're indicate they, they've been associated with uh, um, uh, cancer 
in, uh, in past studies. So we're really interested in quantifying the, the reduction in pHs throughout the, uh, the wood stove changeout. So this is a figure that shows over this period of time the number of stoves that were changed out and when they were changed out. So this is the, the number of stoves on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the time period. And as it shows between um, the summer of 05 and uh, the summer of 07, that's when the majority of the stoves were changed out. Um, 1,100 total changes and 75% went from, from combusting wood to combusting wood, but, but in, uh, in, in low emission devices, 11% went to pellets, 81 rebuilds and um, just gave up their stoves altogether and, and uh, took them out of circulation. This is uh, the results of the PM 2.5 over that period of time. And I'll uh, kind of walk you through the slide. So this is the, the, the year from 2001 to 2009. This is the annual PM 2.5 concentration over that period of time. This is the 24 hour average concentration over that period of time. And the Y axis is the, uh, the concentration. So the blue is the, the annual concentration or the average, uh, I'm sorry, the, the average P, the daily concentration. So this is before the wood stove change out and then the change out is happening. And as you can see, it kind of drops at the, in the post change out um, years. This is that uh, 35 microgram per cubic meter uh, national ambient air quality standard that I referenced a little bit earlier. This is the, the annual standard of 12. And that when you look at the, the annual averages, this is the pre-wood stove change out, then it starts to kick in right about there. And today the uh, annual average or annual averages are also below the national ambient air quality standards set by EPA. So what this shows is that uh, when looking at uh, both the 24 hour averages and the annual averages, today Libya is in attainment for the PM 2.5 standard set by EPA. So when we looked at the PAHs, you know, we were very interested in a, in a handful that, you know, uh, those that are related to wood burning and then um, those that, that, that have been shown to cause cancer. And what we saw is that uh, these PAHs, um, and we also call them semi-vault organics or SVOCs, we saw about a 64% reduction in these PAHs uh, throughout the duration of the wood stove changeout and individual ones anywhere from 50 to 83 percent reductions. This uh, slide is, uh, or this figure is, is, a, uh, uh, is uh, a trend of the, the reduction of the sum of pHs over that period of time. This is the winter of 0405, the winter of 0506, 0607, 0708. Um, how much was uh, the wood stove was complete? Almost 10 percent, almost 60 percent by the winter of 0607 and then almost completely done by 0708. But notably, the most dramatic reduction in, in total PAH has happened right around here. And that is right when that phase one program uh, kicked in. Remember, I, I mentioned that that was really targeted at the worst of the burners and the worst of the wood stoves of the, the low income families with these really terrible wood stoves. And, and what this showed is that taking those wood stoves out of circulation really did the gave the biggest bang for the buck in reducing levels of PAHs um, during that wood stove change out period. We did another chemical mass balance at the end of the study or at the end of the wood stove change out. And uh, again, no surprise, uh, lower PM 2.5 altogether, but still the, the largest source of, of wood smoke in the valley was uh, residential wood stoves. And when we look at it in uh, tabular form, these are the sources identified by the, the, the chemical mass balance modeling. So same sources were identified. This is the original study. This is the, the post change out study. And just a couple things uh, to point out, the overall mass was reduced by about 26%. Um, th this shows that the residential wood combustion source was uh, reduced by about 28%. Um, but uh, you know, there's some variability in that, but still it's the largest source of PM 2.5 in, in the Libby Valley, even after the wood stove change out was uh, occurred. So just to summarize that, the, the Libby wood stove change out was a success. We did see about, uh, you know, uh, upwards of 26% reduction in ambient PM 2.5 during the winter months. 
the leave glucosan, the, that's the chemical marker of wood burning, that, that was reduced by about 28%. So really tracked nicely with overall PM 2.5 reductions. We saw nice reductions in semi-volatiles and PAHs, anywhere from 50 to 83%. Most of those during that phase one period, uh, taking out the, the worst of the emitters. Um, but it was expensive and you know it was it was a, a, a herculean effort to, to bring that much money together and that many people together to take out that many stoves basically every single stove in the entire community and a lot of times that's just not practical in in uh, in today's uh in today's world um, I'll, I'll mention other interventions uh, that have targeted ambient air. So regulatory programs that includes burn, burn bans, and that's not a really popular option a lot of times where uh, the local health department or, uh, or other entity will, will see in the forecast that a really high stagnation day is approaching. Uh, it'll be very cold, so people are going to be using their wood stoves, so they'll actually uh, you know, outlaw people from using their wood stoves. So that's a problem when, you know, that's their primary source of heat and it's really cold outside. So that's, uh, that's not a great option in my, in my opinion. Um, some communities and state, tribal, local health departments have developed uh, mission standards. Voluntary programs uh, speci specifically targeting wood stove change outs have, uh, have uh, had some traction, including, you know, the, the Tacoma study that Chris Simpson from University of Washington will be talking about and talked about while we were in New Zealand. Um, lots of tax incentives and vouchers to encourage people to change out their wood stoves. And then another thing that's really gaining traction is education and outreach and, and working with, with homeowners and the people that burn the fires to really teach them about uh, best burn practices. And if you've never seen the EPA BurnWise uh, website um, maintained by EPA, specifically Larry Brockman at EPA, it's uh, well worth a visit to the website. They have a lot of great materials, a lot of great videos and protocols and, and uh, tips on what lots of communities throughout the United States are doing. Um, so you might find that useful. All right, so we'll switch gears to talking about indoor air quality. And that's, you know, this is really of interest because we spend most of our time indoors, over 90% or 92% at least it is here in the United States of our time, we are stuck indoors. And in these homes that have wood stoves, um, you know, some of them are not in the best condition and that results in elevated levels of indoor wood smoke from, from the loading and the stoking of the fire, from, from leaky chimneys and, and, and venting uh, packages and then infiltration of uh, your neighbor's wood smoke and in, uh, into, to, into our own homes. So lots of different ways that wood smoke can, can uh, gain entry into our homes or, in, or be within our homes. So we just finished up a study um, called ARTIS, a, a randomized trial for indoor wood smoke. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in just a couple of minutes. But basically we sampled in, in uh, over nearly 100 homes that had wood stoves that also had an asthmatic child throughout um, uh, several areas of the northern Rocky Mountains and up and up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And we measured uh, PM 2.5 and a whole bunch of other things, but the average concentration of PM 2.5 across all these wood burning homes was 34.8 uh, mic uh, micrograms per cubic meter. And there, there is no indoor air quality standard. And to put that number in perspective, um, if you remember the, the daily standard set by EPA is 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So these are, ex these are uh, values that are within people's homes that they, they, you know, they're exposed to every single day that exceed or, 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 or approach the, uh, the national ambient air quality standard of 35 and then exceed that the World Health Organization recommended standard. Um, so, you know, very high concentrations uh, we measured within these wood burning homes uh, just on a daily basis. This is a pretty typical trend of what we see in these wood burning homes. And I, it, like the other figure I presented earlier, the annual one, this is an, another one that's a little older now, but I love it because it really demonstrates, you know, what we see in these wood burning homes. This is a sample that was collected back in uh, October of 2006 which is uh, this our late fall, so it's starting to get cold during, uh, during late October. 
Um, so the, the, the x-axis is the, the time period. So this is every 60 seconds over 24-hour period. And this is the concentration of PM2.5 on the y-axis. And what it shows is that uh, we started collecting sample at, uh, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <clears throat> the lady got home. It was cold outside, so one of the first things she did was, was lit her wood stove. So uh, she lit it, and a big pile of plume of smoke filled up the, the inside of the home, and a nice big spike over 700 micrograms per cubic meter. And then it kind of dissipates out. Um, and then that evening, right before she went to bed, she stoked her wood stove. And that's the act of opening the door, throwing wood in, wood on, again, filling up the room with smoke and dampering it down. And a um, nice big spike over 300 micrograms per cubic meter. Then she went to sleep for the night, and we know exactly what time she woke up the next morning at 6.30 a.m. It was cold, so she lit her wood stove again. And a nice big spike over 500, and then she left for the day. But two things I'd like to point out about uh, this graph. One is just the average concentration over this period of time. It was 132 micrograms per cubic meter. And this is, uh, this, this is a concentration that, that she and her family uh, it, uh, it breathes in every single day throughout the winter months, all winter long, winter after winter after winter. And the, just the sheer acute exposures that are happening within these homes, spikes of over 700, over 300, over 500, anytime they, they loaded or stoked their wood stove. And again, these are exposures that are happening you know, all winter long, winter after winter after winter. And this is important information for, for those that do have, that are susceptible populations, such as the elderly, uh, small children, or people that have cardiovascular or respiratory issues. So this has uh, really been a focus area of ours, for, of our research group for the last 10 years or so. We're really trying to figure out, you know, what are some interventions that we can implement within homes to reduce levels of wood smoke and improve overall health of the people that live in these homes. And a couple of ones that we've evaluated comprehensively have been uh, filtration units and then uh, the wood stove change out, but the impact on the indoor environment. So this is uh, the type of filtration unit that we've used in, in our past artist study. And basically, it's a high efficiency uh, filter um, put out by 3M, uh, the company 3M. And all the room in the air is basically circulated through this filter, and it scrubs out any particles that are in the air. And then we also put, in, put out a, uh, a kilowatt meter. And basically, this measures the amount of electricity that's used for each unit. And we use that for two purposes. One, we can see how much people are actually using the, the filtration unit if they're using it out in high at, at the right setting and, and full time like they're supposed to as part of this research study. And then we could also look at the numbers and, and, uh, and use that to reimburse people for their electricity costs. So we always have a, a kilowatt meter that goes along with these, these filtration units. They work very well. We in, in all of the homes that we've used these filtration units in, we've sent, seen about a 60% improvement in air quality, or a, you know, 60% reduction in PM 2.5. However, there are some expenses. They they cost about $200 uh, US. <coughs> there's yearly filter replacement replacements, so there's a little bit of money spent with uh, replacing filters. They do use uh, energy, so there's a little bit of uh, cost with uh, running these uh, appliances on high for the entire winter. Um, probably the biggest impediment that we've seen is just people turning them off or down because of the noise. Um, it's like having a fan inside of your house. It, if it's really loud, some people it doesn't bother them, some people it drives them crazy. So it's that, that white noise that's in the background. It, um, because some people they don't like it they'll turn off the filtration unit and you know it does no good if it's not running um, so that, that there are some compliance issues the filtration unit, units work fabulous and in, in reducing levels of, uh, of wood smoke but there are some compliance issues with using it so the other thing we've uh, evaluated is the wood stove change out in, in three different programs um, which I'll talk about um, the first one was in Libby, Montana. The second was Nez Perce Reservation. And the third one is this artist study that I mentioned. Um, so the, as far as the Libby program, in addition to doing a bunch of work looking at ambient air quality throughout the duration of the wood stove change out, we also looked at the before and after levels of PM 2.5 in homes that, that got changed out. 
Um, we collected only one sample, 24-hour uh, sample, both before and after. So it's kind of a, a limited data set. Um, these are the two types of instruments that we used. One was the dust track, which is a continuous PM 2.5 monitor. The other one we were interested in collecting a, a quartz filter. So there's a, a Leland pump on the inside of this case and then pulling air through a hose that's hooked up to a, this personal uh, environmental monitor, a PM is what it's called. Inside of that red thing, there's a little um, 37 millimeter quartz filter. And then we would analyze that for organic carbon, elemental carbon, and also leave glucosan and some other resin acids. So that's the, the, the air sampling setup that we would collect both before and after uh, the wood stove change out within 20 homes. And then this is the data from that, that original study. Uh, each of the 20 homes is listed on the x-axis. The concentration of PM2.5 is on the y-axis. Blue is uh, the, the before levels. Red are the after levels. And what we see in almost every single home, we saw pretty high levels of PM2.5 before the changeout, and then pretty low levels of PM2.5 after the wood stove changeout. When we look at the spikes that occurred in each one of the uh, sample runs, both before and after the changeout, we also saw dramatic reductions. The blue again is the, the before, the red is the after, and just glancing at it, you see the average concentration of uh, the spikes before the change out was about over 400 micrograms and it drops down to micrograms per cubic meter and dry, drops down to about 100 micrograms per cubic meter following the wood stove change out. When we look at levoglucosan, kind of the same trend, higher levels before the wood stove change out, lower levels after the wood stove change out. And then when we, when we summarize all this in a, in a table, which it might be a little bit easier to see, here's the same parameters, the pre-levels, the post-levels, and then the percent change. We saw about a 70% reduction in, in indoor levels of PM2.5 when a wood stove change out was, was uh, conducted. Reductions in organic carbon, uh, elemental carbon is kind of a wash. Um, total carbon is basically an organic carbon plus elemental carbon, so we did see a drop in that. We saw a, about a, almost a 50% reduction in, in um, levoglucosan, indicating that uh, you know that is a reduction in not only particles but wood smoke particles. Um, interestingly, interestingly, we saw uh, increases in some resin acids, dehydroabiotic acid and in abiotic acid, and what that suggests is that the chemistry of the particles inside these homes are changing. Uh, different burn conditions going from an older model wood stove to an EPA certified wood stove. Um, different burning conditions releases a different type of particle. So this, this is just something that we noticed inside of these homes. We haven't you know, done very much with trying to figure out what does it mean or what are the associated health effects, health effects are, but we did see just a change in the chemistry, which, which, was, uh, which was kind of interesting. Now, I'll also note that um, this wood stove change out program, it really had a comprehensive training component. Once the new stove was put in, there was a, uh, a wood stove ex expert that would work with the homeowner to teach each one of the homeowners how to operate their new stoves. So that's important in that there was a, a strong training component. <clears throat> so the next study I'll talk about is the Nez Perce wood stove change out program that was, that was conducted on the Nez Perce Indian Reservation which is about uh, 300 miles west of here uh, in Idaho. Uh, very mountainous location, lots of trees, so lots of wood burning. And over a, a three winter period, we evaluated the, the impact of a wood stove change out on the indoor air quality of 16 homes. And this is kind of the, the general trends. Again, the blue is the, the before levels, the red is the after levels. First glance, you see that, uh, you know, higher levels before compared to after. However, if you looked a little closer, you see that, for instance, Home 2 actually had higher levels of, of uh, PM 2.5 after the wood stove change out compared to before. Same thing with Home, uh, home 5, higher levels after compared to before. Um, home 9, the same thing, and, and uh, Home, home uh, 16. So it wasn't quite as clean and neat as the Libby Wood Stove Change Out Program. So when we take a look, a closer look at each one of these homes that had higher levels after the Wood Stove Change Out compared to before, we saw some very specific things. 
Um, here's what we saw. So uh, four homes that actually had higher levels after compared to before. So home two is the blue, home six is the red, this yellow is home 11, 13 is kind of this uh, greenish blue color. So these are the pre-measurements that were conducted inside the homes. After the wood stove change out, these level, uh, these uh, runs were, or these levels were measured. So again, the blue is home two, home six, home 11, home 13. So when we saw this, we knew something was going on. So when we went back to the homeowner and we asked them, you know, what's going on? And, and we provided, figured out what, what happened and then provided the additional training uh, to the homeowner. So for home two, what we found is that they had a brand new wood stove. So they, what they did is they, they would pile the, 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 the wet wood on top of the wood stove to dry it out. And when they did that, some of the sap would leak down on top of the wood stove. So when we sampled before, it wasn't too bad, but when we put in the wood, new wood stove um, and there was resin on top of the wood, uh, wood stove that was burning and creating lots of particulate matter inside the homes, we told them that's probably not a good idea to do that. And when we sampled again, it was a lot lower still high compared to their very original setting or very original sampling event because it was still you know baking off the the resin on top of the wood stove so this home six they actually uh, uh, didn't have their their draft open correctly and their uh, so we we taught them how to do that and on the third sampling event it was actually a lot lower a lot it was where it should have been compared to the pre-levels home 11 um, which is this home right here. So I remember this home uh, uh, because what the older model wood stove, the only way that it did uh, would run is if they left the, the, the door cracked. So anytime they would actually close the door, the wood stove would get, um, you know, the circulation or draft would choke out and it would choke out the fire. So they left the, the wood stove door open all the time that they used the wood stove. So when they put in their new wood stove, they thought that they operated the same way. So they left the wood open or left the door open. And when we measured that, that post measurement for the first time, we saw really high levels of wood smoke. We told them that it was probably not a great idea to do that. So when we measured a third time, we saw pretty low levels and really equivalent to what we saw uh, before. And then this last one, um, they were burning at, at the low temps. They, they weren't reaching the, the concentrations that, uh, or the temperatures that they were supposed to. So we measured the first time um, because they weren't burning correctly. There was a lot of unburned uh, particulate matter being released. When we showed them they're burn at the right temperatures, that the uh, levels were dramatically uh, reduced. So low levels um, or, or training is, is such a was such a key component of this program to, to reach those levels that uh, that that we saw in Libby. Um, the beneficial impacts of the wood stove change out indoors. Um, again, we saw um, about a 52% reduction uh, in overall PM 2.5 when it was all said and done, 60% reduction in spikes. Leave glucosan was reduced by 63%. That tracked pretty nicely with the overall PM 2.5. And then it really kind of clued us in that education is a really important part of any type of uh, program targeting wood stove reduction, uh, smoke reduction, especially when working with a homeowner. So the third one I'll talk about is uh, the ARTIS, which is a randomized trial of uh, indoor smoke. And, and uh, I mentioned that this earlier that this is a, a five-year program that, that sampled in over 100 homes that had wood stoves that also had a, an asthmatic child. And what we did is we recruited a bunch of families into the study, and then we randomized them to either getting a wood stove change out, a filtration unit within the home, or a filtration unit with the placebo filter. Um, that first winter, we collected a bunch of um, exposure measures and also, also health measures on the kids, did the intervention, and then the following winter, we, we sampled again to get those post-intervention uh, uh, measures. And um, so what I'll do is I'll present the results from, from the wood stove arm. Uh, we had 16 homes um, because about halfway or a quarter of the way into the program, we saw that you know, we weren't seeing the dramatic reductions in particulate matter that we wanted to see um, as a result of the wood stove change out. And because it was costing so much, um, we decided to drop that arm of the study. 
um, because the filtration unit, like I said, we saw about a 60% reduction in PM and, you know, we were looking at any changes in the conditions of asthmatics with that reduction. We couldn't really see any changes with, uh, with not a lot of change in particular matter. So we decided to drop that arm of the study. But here's the results of that arm. We sampled in 16 homes. Um, we looked at the, the pre-measures, the post-measures, and we saw about a 9% change in, in overall PM 2.5 mass within these, uh, these wood stove change out homes, about a 30% drop in, in spikes. We also measured uh, particle counts and uh, looking at the sizes of, uh, or the number of particles and different size fractions within these homes. And we saw different reductions in the particle counts. Overall, we saw reductions, but uh, like I said, it wasn't uh, dramatic reductions of what we were hoping for. And because it cost so much money, we dropped that arm from the study. So in, in summary, these wood stove change outs and the impact on indoor environments, you know, these are really promoted by our, our US EPA to reduce wood smoke levels. They can be very expensive, um, you know, upwards of $4,500 when you change out the hearth pad and the stove and the, the vent and the chimney and then pay somebody to do all that work. Um, they, they, as evidenced by Libby, they, they do a good job in reducing ambient PM 2.5, especially if we change out enough of them and the right ones. Uh, the highest emitters. Um, we see more variable results indoors, and but the reason we see the variable results is the learning curve. You know, people tend to use the, their brand new wood stove just like they did their old stove. And if they're not using it correctly, then it's not going to give them that, that maximum reduction in particular matter that, that uh, we'd like to see. <clears throat> So I'm almost done, uh, and just to switch gears one more time and uh, talk about education. So, you know, as we saw from Libby with the really strong focus on educating the homeowner on how to use their new stove uh, from the Nespers wood stove study um, or the change out study where we saw in those four homes when we went back into the homes and provided additional education on how to use their stoves and then saw the reductions, you know, that got us thinking, can, can we use um, education best burn on best burn practices, um, teaching homeowners how to use uh, their wood stoves properly using best burn practices. Can that be a sustainable intervention and a cheap intervention, uh, and you know an easy intervention to use over time? And if, and so that was basically the the basis for um, two large projects that we have ongoing right now, and. This education intervention is something that uh, we spent a little time developing. We have three little videos that we ask our, our, our participants to watch. One introduces the study, the second video, how to prepare your firewood, and then the third one, how to optimize your wood burning. Uh, we provide simple little tools to the homeowner, uh, a moisture meter that basically educates them to, to, to not burn wet wood and to burn dry wood a stove thermometer so they can track the, the, the burning conditions to make, make sure that they're burning at the correct temperatures. And then uh, some fire starters to help the homeowner get their fire up to the, um, the, the right temperature as, as quickly as possible. So they're not having a peek in inside the door each time and you know multiple times while they're lighting their fire. Because each time you open the door, you introduce a lot of wood smoke into the home. So we, we uh, for the people that are participating in the study, you know, we ask them to watch the videos. We provide them with these, uh, these simple tools, and then we provide comprehensive training on, on how to use these, uh, these three tools. And we have a checklist that we go through that kind of hits the high points of the videos and the training on, on the, uh, the moisture meter and uh, the other tools. Um, we note which ones that they had questions about and which one they seem to, to, to not really understand. So we document that and then approximately a month later we call back to the homes and we, we ask how it's going. We re re reiterate those one or two or three or five points that they seem to have questions on the first time around. The idea is that the more times we can hit them with these education concepts and these strategies, you know, the, the more it'll sink in. And we, we assess that um, by conducting a knowledge, attitude, and behavior or CAB survey. And that, that is uh, geared towards helping us understand just how much new information they retain uh, throughout the course of a winter and following the initial training. 
So as far as the two studies that we are currently testing out this, uh, this education intervention, these are um, both uh, funded from the National Institute of Environmental Sciences, which is part of NIH or the National, National Institute of Health here in the United States. First study is called Residential Wood Smoke Interventions Improving Health in Native American Populations. Curtis Noonan and Annie Belcourt are my partners on the project, five-year project going from 14 to 2019. And the partners on the project are the Nez Perce Reservation, uh, just west of us in Missoula, and then down on the Navajo Reservation. Um, two very different types of airsheds and, and, uh, and topography, but both, you know, very cold. They birth, burn wood, but different types of wood. They burn different types of uh, other things like coal down on the Navajo Reservation. So two different study areas, but basically, you know, the goal is to evaluate this, uh, this education intervention. In addition to the education intervention, we're, we are evaluating a, um, another community-wide uh, intervention with this study. And that community-wide intervention is the, is the uh, wood distribution program, where it's almost like a wood bank. The wood is uh, disseminated, that's cut to the proper size, it's uh, low moisture, and the right type of wood it's sent to the, the participants that, that are in the study and stacked the right way. And, and uh, basically, the participants in the study will use this wood as, as part of the, their home heating throughout the winter. Um, in addition to that community-wide uh, community intervention, uh, we're going to evaluate that. We have household-level interventions, and that includes that education uh, intervention that I mentioned. And then comparing that with the filtration unit, which you saw a little bit earlier, which we, we know provides about a 60% re re reduction in PM2.5. And then a fil filtration unit with a placebo filter that serves as our negative control. So three, uh, three different types of interventions um, that the homeowner is randomized to. And the homeowner is uh, elderly participants, so people that are, are 55 or 60 years of age and older um, that live inside of these homes that uh, burn wood primarily, and um, they're the ones that uh, are the, our cohort for this study. We do indoor measures of PM2.5. We also do personal PM2.5 measures. So they carry around this little pouch that's uh, in their breathing zone that measures their personal PM2.5 exposures. And then we're tracking pulmonary function and respiratory symptoms and infections. Uh, pulmonary function is collected with a spirometry. And the overall idea is that we can use education to reduce levels of wood smoke within homes and then increase their pulmonary function and then uh, decrease their, their reporting of respiratory symptoms and infections over time. So the second study I'll introduce and, uh, and, uh, and close with is uh, this kids' air study. So wood stove interventions and child respiratory infections in rural communities. Again, Curtis is my project on the project. Uh, or my partner on the project, five-year project funded by NIEHS, same time period. And the study areas here are Western Montana, uh, again, the Navajo Reservation, but also uh, Alaska, Alaska Native Villages, so very remote parts of Alaska, um, uh, um, but still wood-burning communities, uh, or three very different, succinct uh, wood-burning communities. Interventions are similar to the other, for, to the elders era study, filtration units, placebo filtration, and education. There is no community intervention that we're evaluating as part of this one. Um, instead of elderly populations, we're working with uh, 324 homes, about 500 kids that are five years of age and younger. And what we hope to do is, is use education to reduce levels of wood smoke within homes and then track lower respiratory tract infections in, in these kids that are five years of age and younger. And hopefully the, the wood smoke levels are reduced and also the rates of lower respiratory tract infections are reduced in these kids. All right, so final thoughts. Uh, residential wood combustion is a large source of particulate matter um, in both the outdoor and indoor environments uh, throughout the winter months. Uh, wood stove changeout programs have been very successful in reducing levels of wood smoke outdoors. Um, we see variable results indoors, um, but primarily because of a lack of training uh, when these new uh, stoves are introduced into the homes. 
Air filtration units tend to work very, very well. We see about a 60% improvement in air quality, um, but because of compliance issues, you know, some people don't like it because it, they're too loud or they, they don't change out the filters and they turn it off and they just forget about it. Um, they, they are not used properly most of the, or a lot of the time. And then this, this concept of using education and, and really focusing in on, on what message works best in particular areas, you know, across multiple different types of air sheds and in different countries, including New Zealand and America and Canada, and, uh, and really evaluating the impact of education on can that reduce levels of wood smoke within homes and then also improve the health of residents living within these homes. With that, there's a lot of people involved with these studies and a lot of funding uh, with these studies. And with that, I will close. And uh, thank you for anybody that hung around out there. Uh, I'm sorry again for the technical difficulties. And if you have any questions, uh, you can certainly email them to me and I will do my best to, to answer your questions. Or you can go to the, um, to the website um, that Ayushi has set up and uh, we can answer your questions that way too. So with that, I will close and it is now Tuesday or Monday afternoon here in Montana and uh, 